Welcome to Buckeye TV's live special, Time and Change at Ohio State. I'm your host, Alice Bacani. And I'm Hayden Grove. Thanks so much for joining us tonight for our Spring 2014 live show special. This show is all about time and change, right out of the famous lyrics of Carmen, Ohio. We have an hour to take you through the alma mater lyrics and how they apply to each and every aspect of Ohio State. We have a lot of time and change to get to, so let's get started. Time and change will surely show how firm thy friendship. Time and change will surely show how firm thy friendship, Ohio. Time and change will surely show how firm thy friendship, Ohio. Time and change will surely show how firm thy friendship, Ohio. You're watching Buckeye TV's live special. Time and change will surely show how firm thy friendship, Ohio. to Buckeye TV Studios on this April 14th, 2014. Tonight, we're talking time and change. And the university has seen plenty of time and change over the decades and even just this past year. That's right. This year, one of the biggest changes we've seen is the transition of the university president as former President Gordon Gee leaves the Buckeye State for West Virginia University and Dr. Drake begins his journey in scarlet and gray. And don't forget about the man in the middle of it all, Joseph Valuto. This year has been a quite a transition for the university. We sat down with former President Gee and interim president Joseph Aludo to talk about just that. I think that uh, I, I think that one of the main things that I'll miss is the opportunity to continue to connect with all of you wonderful students. I mean, really, they, you've been such a major part of my life, and I have such an incredible love affair with all of you, um, and uh, feel very strongly that. Uh, you in many ways uh, were my family and remain my family. You know, I've had, uh, I, I can't imagine over 35 years how many students I've had as members of that family, but I have a big one. And, uh, and I feel very committed to um, making certain that uh, our students know that uh, I believe very strongly in them and their future, and they've got a very bright one indeed. We've got an Ohio State degree. Well, I think I, I think every president uh, is unique and different. I think uh, 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 Gordon had a has a particular personality, a character that is unique, and uh, students will uh, understandably miss that. I think uh, Michael Drake will have a different personality, a different sense of uh, of how he connects with people, just as I did in the year that I've been here. So uh, they're all a little bit different, and uh, and they're not the same. One of the things I think that Ohio State has to begin to understand is that uh, while Gordon has just a wonderful personality, a unique embracing of everything and, and everyone, but particularly students, that's not typical of our presidents throughout history. Uh, and so you celebrate that difference. Uh, and then you, hopefully as an institution, we then embrace a different style, a different set of fo foci, uh, a different uh, way of interacting with people. And that's what we'll have with, with, uh, with President Drake. Well, you know, this is the place that I, th this was, th this was where I started at age 36. It was kind of an interesting closing of a circle for me. Uh, the people of West Virginia gave me an opportunity that was unprecedented in this country uh, to become a university president of a major institution at age 36. And um, now, in the best Woody Hayes sense, an opportunity to pay forward, but also to go back and uh, be among friends and to uh, be at a vibrant institution and hopefully make a difference. Uh, in this life as, I, uh, as, as it will make a difference in mine. Obviously, I won't get a chance to, uh, to uh, greet everyone uh, uh, on the uh, crawl, which I, which I love to do, and, uh, and at commencement. So I hope that everyone knows that uh, I have uh, such deep personal affection and respect for our students and for our faculty and staff and for the alumni and friends of this university. But clearly, uh, this is a time of passage for them. It's been a time of passage for me. And what I think we all discover is, if, is that, um, that through passage, uh, opportunities and doors will open and, and everyone's going to have, uh, 
have uh, more extraordinary opportunities in front of them than they've had up to this point. And we can't talk about president changes without talking about the incoming president. That's right. Dr. Michael Drake will officially take office on June 30th. We talked to a few Buckeyes about what Dr. Drake will bring to Ohio State, and I think you may recognize a couple of these faces. Oh, he'll, he'll, he'll do wonderful things. You know, I think that, uh, first of all, this university attracts great leadership, save one. Uh, <laughs> this university attracts great leadership, and, um, and Michael is different from me. Um, and that's good because I think that I think that universities need to reinvent themselves, and I think that it requires different leaders at different times. And I think that uh, with the focus on um, on medicine and and the opening of our new hospital, a variety of other things, someone who comes out of that uh, corner of the world uh, is really a good choice at this particular time. And I know him personally; he's a wonderful man, and I just uh, I just have just great affection for him and. Uh, we've had a long-standing friendship. Well, I think, first of all, what's going to remain, uh, no matter what happens, is that the traditions are still going to live at Ohio State uh, University. I mean, we have some great traditions here, and those traditions will continue to live under whoever the president might be. But I, I think that Dr. Drake uh, is a wonderful fit for uh, the Ohio State University. He's a very, very smart man. He, he knows the workings of uh, a, an institution of higher learning. Uh, he knows that inside and out. Uh, the fact of the matter that uh, he has a background in medicine and we have a world-class hospital and our health sciences program is just uh, terrific. I think uh, he's going to really re be an asset uh, when it comes to that. But I think one of the most important things that uh, Dr. Drake brings to uh, the table for the Ohio State University is that uh, I, I, I seem to believe that he is student-focused. And at a big university like Ohio State, with the number of students that we have here, our president really does need to be uh, student-focused. And I think Dr. Drake is student-focused, and the student's experience is going to be very, very important to him. Well, what he'll bring is a different perspective. Uh, when I came to Ohio State in uh, 1991, one of the things that struck me was uh, the people I met at Ohio State who understood the values of Ohio State also made assumptions about what couldn't happen at Ohio State because at some point in their history it had been tried and it may not have worked. When you come in with a new perspective, you see all kinds of opportunities. You begin to understand that you're seeing both the consistency that's critical but you're also seeing the opportunity to do things a little bit differently, uh, but in ways that are aligned with the fundamental values of the university. And I think that's what a new president will always bring in. It will be an attempt to provide a steady progress from where we are today to where we'd like to be, but also a different way of looking at the assets that, that are here, the structures that are here, the processes that are here, uh, the faculty that have built the institution to this level. The students who, you know, every year we say it's a better student group. Well, interestingly enough, it's a better student group on a foundation of outstanding students. Uh, so the change is there, but the change is not as extreme as you might think. It's a, there's, there's a wonderful uh, consistency and continuity to it that makes it an exciting place to be. So I think he's been pretty intentional about helping us to understand what's important to him. I'm very impressed because students are such a core component of um, what he says and what he does related to the importance. Um, the institution is about the education of our citizens and giving access and opportunity to our students, both in the classroom and co-curricularly. And I think he really gets that. He has a real firm um, commitment to integrity, a real sense of learning ought to be fun, and a sense that we are here to provide opportunities for our students so they become great citizens. Well, we've talked about new presidents without even mentioning another shift in office. Ohio State's student government will see a change in presidency as well. Now we're joined by former USG Vice President Josh Ahart, former President Taylor Stepp, and new President and Vice President Celia Wright and Leah LeCur were unable to attend tonight. Thank you for joining us. Here we are. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Uh, let's stay on the topic of President Drake. Uh, what do you think he's going to bring to Ohio State? I think Dr. Drake is going to bring a lot of things to Ohio State. It's a new energy. It's a new presidency. It's a new era at Ohio State. And that's the most exciting thing about it. Um, what I do love is that it's been a long time since Ohio State has had a first lady. And so uh, Dr. Drake's wife is going to be really good to invigorate a different side of the community that we haven't seen in a long time. He's also going to bring a lot of experience with the Med Center 
and just a different interaction with students. And I've seen him, I've talked to him, and he's really excited to come here um, and make this one of the most important things he's ever done in his entire life. Great. And now, former President McGee was very popular with the students. Yeah. So what do you think the high State community, especially the students, will miss about him? I mean, I think the biggest thing with Dr. V that they miss is just his personality. You know, you could, you could see him anywhere, anytime, and he'd be hanging out, smiling. He would always stop for a picture. Um, and that's something that Dr. Drake would, will need to do as well and think of students first. Um, and I think that they're going to miss overall just seeing, you know, ceremonies at like graduation and candlelight ceremony, things like that that you normally see Dr. Gee at. But I think that the students are excited about the new presidency. And although they miss Dr. Gee, they understand that he has moved on and he's happy where he is. So our theme for this show, Josh, is time and change. And uh, how did you think that USG progressed through your time in the office? So we worked on a lot of things this year. And, I, and definitely this summer when we found out about the, um, the presidency uh, switch was something that really affected our agenda. And we had to work a lot harder on things like the presidential search committee that we didn't even plan for. Um, and it took up a lot of our time, but it was the best time that we could have spent. It's the most important thing that we could have done. Um, and we worked a lot on the affordability initiative, um, trying to make Ohio State a leader in, trying, in, to, in being an affordable university for every student. Um, something that I'm very proud of is that we got this year $75,000 in student organization funding and Greek philanthropy funding. Uh, it's the highest number ever before. And so that's something I was really uh, excited about. The other thing is, uh, especially after yesterday, which was an anniversary, um, of the loss for one of our members in USG. Mental health is something that we have pushed for this year and the ball is rolling and actually something's gonna get done with it. And I think that that was probably most my, my most important um, accomplishment this year. And looking back uh, and now, I'm still gonna work on that. It's still gotta get done and students still need help um, with those things anytime that they need it. Great, and now USG has a new administration, so what do you hope Celia and Leah will bring to it? Celia and Leah had a really good uh, platform. Both of our platforms are very similar, um, and the biggest thing that they're gonna bring is a new sort of personality um, to USG, and they're gonna bring um, a different you know, atmosphere than Taylor and I brought. Um, it's a new level of excitement, just like with the new presidency here, and I'm excited for them. I'm working with them. Uh, to help get things like the mental health thing done, but also I know that they want to increase the relationship with the city of Columbus and the state of Ohio. That's where we get all of our work done for students that truly, truly matters. Um, and I know that they have a lot of different um, other platform points that they want to get done, but those are some of the bigger ones, biggest ones. Well, thank you so much for being here with us tonight, Josh. We appreciate it. Yeah. Although Taylor Stepp was, was unable to make it to the show tonight, we did talk to him about the change he experienced during his time as USG president. Uh, I, I've seen tremendous ta change during my time here at Ohio State. Um, I mean, you look at the, the physical changes. I mean, you look at the fact that um, we, we now have, you know, Park Stradley, Smith Steve connected. Um, you look at the fact that North Campus is on some pretty severe construction. But I think the really interesting thing that I've, the most interesting thing that I've witnessed is the, the change in makeup of our students. I believe when I came here, the average ACT was 25. I believe it's, what is it, 28 now? It's something close to that. And as a result of that, I've noticed uh, a change in the, the, the types of students we have here. And it's, it's really been interesting for me to kind of see the, uh, the cross section of people interacting and, uh, and, and what that means for the future of the university. I think that that's one of our uh, most interesting dilemmas as a land-grant institution. Um, moving forward, obviously wanting to be an academically ex excellent institution, but um, this kind of ongoing question in the university of, you know, uh, where do we want to end up academically? Where, where does this end? Because we've had a pretty uh, dramatic rise in our academic standards, and as a land-grant institution representing the peoples of the state of Ohio, do we stop? And if so, where do we stop? Well, I mean, the university's in a great time of transition here. Um, we lost a, a tremendous leader in, in Gordon Gee, um, a great friend of mine. And I, I think, um, so that's a change. We're talking about time and change here. That's, that's a tremendous change. And, and something that I want to point out that doesn't get talked about enough is, is Joe Aludo. 
Um, excellent provost. He was going to step down, but he stayed around um, in an interim president capacity um, to lead this institution and to really maintain stability. It's not easy um, in times of transition to maintain um, not only just the status quo, but moving the institution forward, and he's done a great job of that. And I, and I don't think that he gets recognized enough. So let's not just talk about Gordon to Drake. Let's talk about the role that Aluto has played as well. I was on the presidential search committee, one of the most fascinating um, processes I've ever been involved in. Um, I'm very pleased with President Drake. I think President Drake adds a number of um, experiences and uh, uh, that will help him greatly at this university. And his, his background and his insight to uh, problems in healthcare, to um, conflict resolution, and, and, and you know, really he's just a great leader. Graduating seniors, we're here for another big transition, and it's not a change in presidency. We're talking about the quarter to semester transition. Now, Hayden, you didn't have to experience that, right? No, I came here after the transition took place, but you were here through it all, correct? I was here, and it was not a fun experience at all. But we have more on the quarter to semester transition and what it meant for Ohio State. Logan Hickman will tell us more. Time and change. Perhaps there's been no greater recent change at Ohio State than the quarter to semester conversion, which presented students, faculty, and staff a unique set of challenges. Well, the biggest challenges were, I think, twofold. And one is just the mechanics of mm -hmm. doing this. It's taking 12,000 classes that are out there that are in a number of, you know, over 100 degree programs. But there's a cultural side to all of this. And I think after being many, many years on quarters, our students were in the kind of psychology of quarters, if right. you will. And so that too proved to be a kind of an interesting challenge because during that first year, I remember most of the complaints that we got were not on the quality of the classes or the scheduling or the mechanical things, but were really on, oh my God, I am overwhelmed mm -hmm. under semesters, where I didn't feel that way under quarters. Despite the necessary switch to semesters, former undergraduate student government president Taylor Stepp said he prefers quarters. As a student, I really preferred quarters. I was able to maintain my focus more. I was more invested in my classes. I like the timing better. Uh, I just don't like semesters. Despite semesters' possible shortcomings, Provost Steinman says OSU is still striving to work out any kinks two years later. A lot of complaint uh, from students, I think, that the, the fall uh, semester th seems very long. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at the prospects of introducing a fall break into that semester. We continue to look at issues of our, are we offering the right classes at the right time going forward. That's extremely important. There's also a group studying whether we should have three commencements or two commencements, mm -hmm. like most universities right. do. So we current, we used to have four. We're now at three. There is, there is uh, some belief that maybe the summer commencement could disappear um, and we could have two major commencements. The newly elected USG administration says it will continue to make sure all possible problems with the conversion are ironed out in the coming months as well. We need to continue to make sure that things that were promised to students, like the low cost for May semester or no cost, is still there and that their course fees and program fees do not increase and have a bigger burden on students as a result of this transition. For Buckeye TV, I'm Logan Hickman. Next, we're going over to Ritika Shah, who has some live stats for us on the subject of time and change. She'll be breaking down numbers from the most popular majors, student demographics, and enrollment over the years. Ritika, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Alex and Hayden. Let's go back in time to when Ohio State was first founded in 1870. Classes began in September of 1873 with only 24 students meeting just two miles north of Columbus. In 1878, the first class of six men graduated with Ohio State's first female graduate following just a year later in 1879. By the turn of the century, in the 1900-1901 school year, just 1,465 students were enrolled at the university. Let's take a look back at how that changed throughout the millennium. Fifty years ago, we saw a total enrollment of 33,284 students, which increased to 59,547 students 25 years later. Enrollment took a small dip one decade ago in 2003 with 58,254 students. 
Compare that today with a total enrollment of 63,964 students across all campuses. As of 2012, the U.S. News & World Report ranked Ohio State as the fifth largest university in terms of enrollment. So we know how many students attended OSU, but let's take a look at a breakdown of how these students played across the decade. Just 10 years ago, OSU was split pretty evenly with a slightly higher female demographic at 50.4%. Today in the 2013-2014 school year, we see the male demographic stepping up to 50.8%, increasing ever so slightly. Jumping back to 2003, Caucasian students made up the largest part of the university with international students coming in second and black students third. Currently, Caucasian students make up the majority of the diverse community here at Ohio State, but with a significant increase in the international student population as well as the Asian American and Hispanic student population. Now let's take a look at what OSU students have been studying throughout the decade. Going back in time to 2003, psychology, biology, and English were ranked as the top three most popular majors at OSU. After a decade has passed, however, biology replaces psychology at the top with finance coming in third. It'll be interesting to see how these trends continue to play out in the future. That's all I have for now. Back to you guys at the desk. Thank you, Ritika. We're going to take a short break, and when we return, we have an Ohio State dentistry graduate from the class of 1954 live on our set, and he has some stories about how different OSU was when he came here. Plus, we'll take a look at some changes that students have seen over the last four years, as well as campus development, and even some extreme weather conditions here on campus. Stay tuned to Buckeye TV's live special. We'll be right back after some more notable Buckeyes tell us what time and change at Ohio State means to them. Stay with us. First of all, it says that university is, uh, uh, that the university is more powerful than any individual. It also says that individuals do make a difference. I think it's kind of that interesting balance. Uh, leadership is important, quality of, uh, quality of leadership wherever they find themselves, whether it's the, whether it be in the chemistry laboratory or on the football field. And, um, and I think it says, uh, to me at least, that we have always been able to attract and retain very highly talented people. Well, I, I, when, you, when you say that, it, it just makes me really feel and, and believe how strong the university is. I mean, really. I mean, it shows that we strive for excellence, that we're committed to, to excellence, uh, whether it's uh, in the classroom or whether it's uh, in, in, in uh, uh, facilities for our athletes or having the best coaches for our athletes or hiring the best faculty that we can hire. Uh, we're committed to excellence and, and that's what that tells me. Well, it means the consistency that takes place over time. This is an institution where there are many changes and those changes take place at the surface of the institution. So we'll have new programs, we'll have new people we bring into the university, all of whom quickly become a part of the Ohio State culture, and that culture, which uh, permeates everything that we do, stays constant, and it provides a sense of transition generation to generation for students. That's really what is represented uh, by Carmen Ohio, and it's what we see quite literally every day on this campus. I think what it says about the university is we are really committed to extraordinary experiences for our students. We are really committed to being a flagship institution we are really committed to being an economic engine for the state. Welcome back to Buckeye TV's live special, Time and Change. You just heard from some notable Buckeyes on what time and change means to them. And now we're joined by our special guest and another notable Buckeye, Dr. Kenneth Clemens. Dr. Clemens is a graduate of the Ohio State School of Dentistry, class of 1954. He has received the 2011 Mershon Award for demonstrating exceptional leadership and service to the Ohio State University, and he still practices dentistry in Lima, Ohio. Dr. Clemens, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Now, before the break, you told us that when you first came to school here, it was an op open enrollment and no admission testing, but that's a lot different of the process of getting into school now. So what do you think about that change? As long as there's open enrollment someplace in Ohio, uh, funded by the state, I'm, I'm for it. But if they deprive that opportunity for people to have a an open enrollment funded by the state of Ohio, I'm okay with it, but if they don't, 
I, I'm not happy with that. <laughs> you said you went to dental school with 98 men in your class. Um, were there any women enrolled during that time? Uh, in the class ahead of me, there was one woman. In the class behind me, there were two. Okay, and how did that, you know, how is that different from today? I mean, well, how there, is that dynamic different? I, uh, I work at a welfare clinic, and we have fourth-year dental students come up to Lima from OSU, and 45% uh, of the people there are women, and I they're really bright, they're good dentists, I enjoy them, I, I love what I'm doing with that. Uh, I have no problem with that. It's late coming. <laughs> uh, you know, it's the way it was when I was there. But we've changed about a lot of issues like that. Right, and then you said also during that time, a lot of college men were in the service and many of them attending the university on the GI Bill. Tell yeah. us about that. Well, World War II changed the world, but the GI Bill changed America. You know, my, my mother went to a freshman high school. My dad went to sixth grade. I had not a great hope for going to college. I got in the Army, and uh, somebody explained to me about the GI Bill and what you had to do to be a dentist, and, and I thought, well, I'm going to try that. It changed my life. It changed a lot of lives. You realize that when I came here to school, Thor had been all the men for a four or five year period of college age were in the military. Within a two year period, they all came back. <laughs> and not only did they come back, uh, some of the people had been taken out of college. And then you had all those high school classes graduating. And uh, one of my friends was a milkman <laughs> before the war and decided that he wanted to be a dentist after he got out of the service. So he's 40 years old when he graduated from dental school. Uh, so there's all that mass of people came back. It, it changed the lives of so many people, it's unbelievable. Uh, certainly changed mine. You know, my folks never owned a home, never had a new car. The greatest pleasure of my life is I bought my mom a home. Wow. <laughs> so and that would have never happened without the opportunity to get an education and become a dentist. Right. Um, you talked about, you know, when we were talking earlier, you said that you know, the, the Ohio State University has changed structurally since you came. Can you oh. talk a little bit about the classroom and oh. uh, how it was different? Well, when you have that all that mass of people coming back at one within a short period of time, there was not enough classroom space, so they took old GI barracks and threw them up all over the place, uh, and maybe Quonset huts. That's where most of my lecture type classes were. The only thing I think I did without that was like anatomy classes in Hamilton Hall and chemistry in the chemistry buildings. <laughs> but the rest of it was in the, those kind of places. There were no parking garages. Uh, when I left here, uh, let's see, the student union that was recently torn down was being built. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I got to help pay for it, but I didn't get to use it. <laughs> and the St. John's Arena was going up as I left school. Uh, Postal Hall, the dental school, when I started my freshman year, part of the year we spent in Hamilton Hall, where the dental school was in Hamilton Hall. Then uh, Postal Hall was built. It's due to be destroyed, I hope, and a new building built. <laughs> so, you know, there were all those changes. Uh, there were no men's dorms except for stadium dorm. And I think the only woman's dorm was Baker Hall. Uh, most of us, the housing around here was so bad, a lot of people commuted. I commuted from Lancaster, and we carpooled in between quarters, there's always some meeting at some tavern to <laughs> find out who you could <laughs> carpool with. Right. Uh, it was very different. Yeah, sounds very different. And then you also told us that you went to school with some Olympic medalists. What was that like? Well, sports were a great thing when I went to school also. Uh, one of the guys I've worked in the kitchen with at the Sci Omega House 
was a weightlifter named Peter George, and he won uh, medals in three consecutive Olympics. There had been no Olympics in, during the war. The first was in 48 and then in 52. But Pete won a gold and two silvers in consecutive Olympics, beat the Russians, you know, <laughs> and uh, his brother also won a silver medal. Uh, we had a lot of other, there was a man named Mal Whitfield, was the most graceful middle distance runner I ever saw. And he won uh, two, three gold medals, one Olympics in 48, he won 800 meters and set an Olympic and world record. He was on the 1600 meter uh, relay team. And the following in the 52, he won the 800 again and equaled his previous world record time. And there were a lot of great athletes. During my time in school, there were three Heisman Trophy winners. The first one we ever had, a dentist, <laughs> Les Horvath, then Vic Janowitz, and then Hopalong Cassidy. Uh, so the, and the swimming, we had, uh, the first swimming coach we ever had was Mike Pepe. And people said, if you want to be a world-class diver, you come to Ohio State and have Mike be your coach. They won, I think, 101 out of 113 possible diving championships during his coaching career. Uh, one Olympic team, I think it was 52, there were 25 members on the team. Nine of them were Ohio State graduate, or students. So athletics was a big thing at that time, but I think they probably filled the horseshoe, which was truly a horseshoe at that time. Uh, I think maybe five times in my seven years in school. Wow. There were always lots of, there were empty seats. Wow. Pretty different from today. Yeah. The basketball games were played in the fairgrounds. <laughs> yeah, that's and right. so they were building St. John's as I left the campus. That's very different. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today, but thank you I so much for coming down to campus. Well, thank you. Thank you. We really welcome. appreciate hearing your experiences. Yeah. It was a great life. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Things sure have changed on campus, right, Alice? Yes, they have. Ohio State has made some big strides. Not to mention big strides in tuition. Would you believe that one year at Ohio State used to be just $45 a quarter? That's pretty crazy to believe, but let's see if it's true. Chelsea Spears dug deep into Ohio State's pockets to bring you this next story. Over the past three generations, we've definitely had over 10 go to Ohio State. <laughs> over 10. Generations of Dalton family members have attended Ohio State. Really, I was just born a Buckeye. I've always had Michigan stickers in the bottom of my toilets and Ohio State decorations every room of the house. Riley is the youngest member of the Daltons, and in three years, she'll be the family's most recent Buckeye graduate. It was kind of a tradition in my house. Um, if I wanted my parents to pay for college, I had to go to Ohio State. And paying for Ohio State has changed over the years as tuition prices have increased. Tuition at OSU Maine currently sits at a little more than $10,000 a year, but that number used to be much lower. The Daltons know firsthand. Okay, my uncle in 45, it was $45 um, for a quarter. And then my dad in 1949, it was all the way up to $49 for a quarter. When Riley's mom and dad graduated from OSU in 1980, they say the cost was about $250 per quarter. While tuition prices have undoubtedly increased, the Daltons, like many others, believe an OSU education is well worth the price. I think the, the education you get, I think they've raised the bar significantly. And while tuition prices may continue to rise, the Daltons are hoping future grandchildren will be proud Buckeyes too. To have parents go there, meeting there, have all three of my kids go there, our dogs are named, you know, Buckeye and Woody. Um, it's, uh, I certainly hope I have grandkids that go there. Chelsea Take Spears, over. Buckeye TV. Next, we're going to hear from Dr. Javon Adams-Gaston and get her take on the time and change she's seen this year and throughout her time at Ohio State. Andrea Henderson sat down with the Vice President for Student Life. Here's more. 55,000 students on Ohio State's campus, more than 175 majors, and hundreds of clubs and activities. 
But there's one thing that all Buckeyes learn before parting ways with this university, and that's the alma mater. Buckeye TV sat down for an exclusive interview with the Vice President of Student Life, where she gave us her take on the tune and recent changes here on campus. There are very few places where everyone knows the um, alma mater's uh, theme song, and everybody here knows Carmen, Ohio. And when you get to the part about time and change will surely show, as I interact with alums and I interact with um, folks who have gone on, one of the, the key components has been, I am firmly a part of the Ohio State University. The alma mater focuses a lot on time and change, which there has been a lot of on campus over the past year. One notable change has been the introduction of the second year transformational experience program. Without a doubt, the STEP program in the North Residential District will transform the student experience at this university for better and different ways than ever before. Administration just broke ground on this project in August with the hopes of keeping second year students more connected to campus. Not only are we saying it's important for us to think about that second year, we're using the evidence, the data that tell us that interaction with faculty, staying on campus, having a sense of belonging to the university, having a sense One of the most obvious changes on campus throughout the years has always been the physical structure. Between buildings and parking lots, something is always going up and something else is always coming down. Students know that all too well with the constant construction on campus. Brooke Sayre took a look into campus development throughout the years. The Ohio Union, Thompson Memorial Library, two iconic facilities that Ohio State has to offer to its students that has a fantastic history. Originally, the University Library was housed in original University Hall, moved it into Orton Hall. Even when they moved in, they said it was too small. And so Thompson Library was built in, and opened in 1913, uh, so it's just over 100 years old. Thompson Library has went through three major transformations and renovations. The most recent tried to go back to its roots. Um, they really looked at what the old look like and they were really true to its original. Now if you looked at a picture from 1913 when it opened and you look at one today, it's amazing how similar they look. It's kind of a nice going back to the way it was 100 years ago. The Ohio Union has also went through some changes. So the original student union, which is now known as Hale Hall, um, was the first student union at a public university. But after World War II, the need for a bigger space was evident. So the students petitioned and got together and um, agreed to pay a $5 a quarter fee to build the new Ohio Union. Some of the features of the old Ohio Union included a bowling alley, a pool table room, and a record room, in addition to a ballroom and dining facilities. And it's very similar reason of why the students wanted it then as to why the students want it now. They wanted a place to get together, they wanted a place to be able to go and eat, have their clubs. Although our current union was built in 2009, the time and change may have altered the appearances of these iconic buildings, but the heart remains faithful to Ohio State and its students. From Buckeye TV, I'm Brooke Sayre. Speaking of all those changes, another area on campus has made its own strides for a whole century. Ariana Bernard takes us through 100 years of Ohio State's Wexner Medical Center. 100 years provides a lot of time for change, and with the celebration of its centennial, the Ohio State Medical School is looking back with pride and forward with purpose. The College of Medicine was founded in 1914 when the Starling Ohio Medical College became affiliated with Ohio State. Since then, there have been many changes. One of the biggest is the increase in class size, growing from 36 to now over 200 students. Another notable change includes the $1.1 billion medical center expansion project that began in 2010. To uh, increase the capacity of the medical center, also improving some of the infrastructure of the medical center, uh, for example, going to more private rooms rather than wards, uh, in, enlarging our operating room suites, uh, providing uh, better equipment. Some of the highlights of the medical school include the use of computers for medical education as well as curriculum advances. 
when computers were, be, were coming on to the scene, the Ohio State University College of Medicine really adopted that very, very early on much earlier than many of the other medical schools. I think the other thing is the curriculum advances in the College of Medicine have been substantial. In other words, uh, introducing students to clinical activities earlier on in their education has been a, a hallmark of training at The Ohio State University. This training has led to many notable alumni. Over the years, when you have a faculty uh, as strong as Ohio State, um, you have many uh, that are successful. Looking forward into the future, a new plan has been implemented that gets medical students involved with clinical education earlier on. Drawing blood, doing physical examinations, being involved with patient care from day one. As the education program is continuing to evolve, team training is becoming more and more important. It's not just about that one point where you see the patient initially with the problem, but it's about all the other aspects of health care. And that's that's where medical education is going. It's going to be much more focused on team. The medical school is ranked number 29 for primary care and number 34 for research by U.S. News & World Report's 2014 medical school rankings. Reporting for Buckeye TV, I'm Ariana Bernard. This year, Ohio State some ex ex experienced some extreme weather conditions and the result was three days off for students. Our Buckeye TV meteorologist Mackenzie Bart has more on this semester's weather and the extreme weather conditions of years past. Weather has definitely changed over the past year, but something that many Ohio States haven't seen before is the closure of Ohio State's campus. Now, Ohio State has closed three times this past winter season because of extremely cold temperatures. And it has closed 11 times over the past 40 years because of cold temperatures, ice storms, snowstorms, and excessive wind. Now I'm going to break down the first uh, couple of days of this semester that campus was closed, and also the very first time that campus was ever closed at Ohio State, which, which was the blizzard of 1978. Now let's take a look at January 6th and 7th. So this is one of the first days of the s semester starting. And we saw a high of 11 degrees, low temperature of negative 7, which was record-breaking for the Columbus, Ohio area. Wind speeds reaching 32 miles an hour, a wind chill anywhere from negative 20 to negative 30 degrees. And then we only saw snow of 0.3 inches. But the main thing that happened with this polar vortex was the amount of extreme cold that we saw. So you can see from this map, temperatures were in the single digits. And because of this, resulted six deaths in the Columbus area. Something that I want to show you is this graphic here that shows the departure of normal temperatures for the, for the month of January. As you see in the Ohio area here, we saw a negative 10 to negative 15 average of departure from normal temperature in the beginning of January. At the end of January, we are anywhere from negative 15 to negative 20 below the normal temperature. Now let's take a look at the very first time Ohio State ever canceled classes, and that was the blizzard of 1978. That day they saw a high of 14 degrees, low of 9, wind speeds reaching a max of 69 miles an hour, a wind chill of negative 50, snow reached an accumulation of 4.7 inches, but with the wind speeds being that high, it was creating these massive snow drifts. As you see by this picture here, the man standing on top of his roof, you can see how high these drifts became. And because of the this, they called in the National Guard to rescue people, to plow the roads, and to also bring in food and water supplies. Because of this great blizzard, they resulted 51 deaths in the Columbus, Ohio area. Now you may wonder, how does Ohio determine to cancel classes? Well, many things play a part in this. They gather weather information from local authorities. They also consult with the facilities, maybe even talking to uh, public officials. Also, the National Weather Service plays into part of this. And then some factors, the existence of a level three snow emergency, are there hazardous roadways? Also, the excessive wind and severe cold. That is your live special, Time and Change. I'm meteorologist Mackenzie Bart. Back to you guys in the studio.
Those days of extreme cold have me so excited for summer, Alice. Me too. It's definitely time for some Oval Beach, but first, let's take a quick break. We'll be right back with a football seasoned alum live in studio and a word on time and change from Gene Smith, Urban Meyer, and more. As we take a quick break, we'll leave you on a lighter note and show you some of the fun our famous Buckeyes had during their Buckeye TV interviews. You're watching Buckeye TV's live special, Time and Change at Ohio State. Don't go away. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> it's all edited. Okay. <laughs> yep. You're watching Buckeye TV's live show special. Time to change the video. <laughs> Is the pa uh, can you see the paper in the shot? No, you can't. Okay, right. Buckeye TV's <laughs> live show special. Um. <laughs> <laughs> and that's terrible. Okay. Three, three. Yeah, what did you say? You can just look at the camera. Because it's just going to be like a message. No, no, I know, I know, but I don't want to read the damn thing. That's what oh. I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, you watch? Okay. Uh, live? Time and change will surely show. I'll, I'll firm my friendship. In the camera? Yeah. Time and change will surely show. I'll firm my friendship. Oh, wait. I'll, I'll blow that. If I'm not singing it, that's hard to say. Right, right, I need to be singing it. <laughs> but uh, I'm Eugene Smith, uh, Vice President and Director of Athletics uh, here at The Ohio State University. And I just want to thank uh, all of you uh, for watching the show and, and Buckeye TV. Uh, affirm that friendship. I can't say that. I can't do it. <laughs> I can't do it. Say it again. How, how firm that or time and change will surely show. How firm that friendship. Oh, my God. You're watching Buckeye TV live show special. I'm sorry, screw that one. Yeah, I know. I'm, uh, I'm actually not very good at memorizing I, lines. I would be a terrible actor. I'm no, no, you. I would too. <laughs> Welcome back to Buckeye TV's live special, Time and Change. Next, we're going to our sports reporter, Jordan Elwood, who is live in our studio. Jordan is joined by her grandfather, Frank Elwood, who played football at Ohio State from 1953 to 1956 and was an assistant coach for the Buckeyes from 1958 to 1964. Jordan, thanks for being here with us and inviting your grandpa on the show today. Thanks, Alice. Thanks, Hayden. Uh, thank you for joining us today. It's my pleasure, believe me. Now, a lot has changed since you were a student here. Not only was campus smaller and tuition less expensive, but football was quite different as well. Now, you were a quarterback and a punter, and players played both on offense and defense. What was that like to play on both sides of the ball? Well, that's probably one of the big changes, um, the fact that you couldn't specialize because you didn't have that much time to practice any specific talent that you might have. So you got to remember, each day when we practice, we spend half our time on defense as well as half our time on offense. So, mm -hmm. consequently, the game was not nearly as exciting as it is now, believe me. Absolutely. So what would you say is the biggest difference from watching football today um, compared to when you played? Well, it's, it's like everything else. When you compare a 1954 automobile with a <laughs> 2014 automobile, the changes are drastic. Football's the same way. Uh, the only thing that's different is the great interest by Ohio State fans. Mm -hmm. Our stadium was full in those days. It only seated 83,000 at that time, but uh, it was still full every single game that we played. The other thing that's different is uh, the tremendous impact that television's had on college football. Mm -hmm. Every game, home game, at Ohio State Stadium when I was in school started at 1.30 on Saturday afternoons. That was a given, and there was no night games at all. There were no three o'clock afternoon games. No games started at noon. Every game started at 1.30 and it wasn't until TV became popular and with their money started dictating the starting times for games. Yes, absolutely. As you mentioned, uh, TV has definitely changed and social media has changed as well. Now players, you know, are online doing their thing and they're actually monitored, you know, their academics are monitored and their social life a little bit as well. And you played under Woody Hayes. What was your relationship with him like without having any social media or television to worry about? Well, the thing were different. Number one, we had no athletic scholarships in those days. Everybody that came to school, uh, you, I came on a part, partial academic scholarship because of a high school record. 
And then I had a job that I had to work. And that's how all of the athletes at Ohio State made their way through school in those days. Consequently, you didn't have a lot of time for any extracurricular activities, really. You just spent your time working and studying, and that's how you, you lived your life. So that is the biggest change. This day and age, with full scholarships, uh, room, board, books, tuition, and then fees, and in some cases spending money, it makes the game completely different, and it doesn't require quite as much all-around effort from the student-athletes, naturally. Mm -hmm. And as you just mentioned, you had to work and go to school and be a football player. And recently in the news, uh, Northwestern has decided to unionize their football team. And I'm sure you have some opinions on that. What do you think about it? Well, my opinion is that I think it's wrong, personally. That's a personal opinion, naturally. Uh, I think if we're going to call it amateur athletics, we still have to keep some form of amateurism in it. And the fact that it's scholarship, which is whether it's an athletic scholarship or it's a music scholarship, no matter what, it's still an amateur event. And I think uh, and as long as we keep it that way, we'll get the support of the people and the stadium will be full. And I'll be interested in what would happen once players become pros. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that's interesting is that it's the United Steelworkers that are back in the Northwestern effort to become a union, which mm -hmm. makes me shake my head just a little bit. Yes, understandable. Now, one thing that has not changed over the years is the rivalry with Michigan. And um, you brought your gold pants here that you guys received back in the day, and they still receive them now. Um, so you, as I said, played and coached under Woody Hayes, but you also were, were pretty good friends with Bo Schembechler. And as we know, the Woody Hayes and Bo Schembechler rivalry is pretty well known. What was it like kind of being in the middle of them? Well, the, uh, actually, I coached with Bo at Ohio State. We were both assistants at Ohio State in the 1958 and then the 1962 seasons. Mm -hmm. uh, Bo then went to Miami, which eventually, because of his record, led to Michigan. Mm -hmm. uh, Bo and I were very good friends. We're probably the only two young coaches on the staff at that time. When I say young, I'm talking about <laughs> in our 20s. Mm -hmm. uh, because Woody's staff had been established and there were quite a few older coaches on his staff. Mm -hmm. I used to always tell Bo that he was more like Woody than Woody was. That was <laughs> one of the things we used to say all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, Bo was just as determined. Uh, they had a lot of the same characteristics. And, and when you think back, Bo played for Woody at Miami of Ohio. Mm -hmm. So I think Bo inherited a lot of Woody, not only as an assistant coach, but as a player. And that's what made them alike. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to come and speak with us. Now we're going to go send it back to Allison Hayden. Thanks, Jordan, and thank you, Frank. Now for another guest who knows a thing or two about Ohio State football. Here's what Urban Meyer had to say about changes in athletics during an exclusive interview with Buckeye TV. Oh, it's, it's one of the things that makes Ohio State so unique. It's, it's a, a question I love to answer because I'm so proud of it. You know, I was a Buckeye ever since I was born. And, and the one thing that hasn't changed is the culture of Ohio State. And I credit, you know, I, maybe this is incorrect, but I credit Woody Hayes. You know, there, there is a, you, when you think about Ohio State, first thing you think of Woody Hayes is pay forward. And that's the give back uh, philosophy that, that exists at probably as high a level as anywhere in the country. You know, we do a Buckeye Cruise for cancer and there's a, we raise 1.2 million. How many schools can do that? But there's also a premium placed on toughness, on education, and doing it the right way, you know, following the rules. That culture today, as you walk through this facility, still exists. And that's, uh, that's a, first of all, it's a credit to Coach Hayes, but then you think about the following coaches and all the former players. Uh, I think that's what makes Ohio State very unique. It's a, it is, the culture is not different. What is different is this school. It's, this is, it used to be a big state institution with open enrollment. Open enrollment. Now I'm getting... Uh, nasty emails from friends of mine whose kids are 4.0s and valedictorians that are getting denied and asking me if I can get them into school. So it's a much different, uh, uh, on campus it's completely different. You know, I see all of these, you know, the Fisher School of Business, all these incredible buildings. We have one of the best medical centers in America. It was just starting back then. So it's a much different environment uh, on campus. Uh, what hasn't changed is the spirit and the culture of Ohio State Athletics. Oh sure, it's uh, I mean, this is just the, the scope, you know, we're one of the, I think the only school with 36, the 36 sports, we have 36 uh, collegiate sports that, uh, that compete. Um, facilities are much different, and the, just the, 
I, I just think when you think of Ohio State, you think of big, how big everything is at Ohio State, and that's 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 a little bit different. Not change, enhance. You know, you change things are broken. You know, we took over uh, uh, from one of the great coaches in, in Ohio State history and college football history, and and uh, there's a little bump in the road, and you know, I think it was 2011. But we didn't. We're not changing. What we're trying to do is enhance and make it stronger. And that you have to. You have to keep enhancing your program because the minute you sit back, someone else is going to try to catch you. So. Uh, we're going to try to enhance tomorrow. You know, every day you're trying to just make things a little better. This is the first time we've had Coach Urban Meyer appear on our live special, and next we have another never-before-seen face. Gene Smith, who has been the athletic director of Ohio State since 2005 and was recently named the vice president of the university, sat down with Buckeye TV to talk about what time and change has been like for him throughout his years at Ohio State. It's just interesting. Uh, a lot of the things that we've tried to do is, is kind of balance what we we're just talking about, our, our, our commitment to our traditions and, and our great history, but at the same time move us into the 21st century. Um, you know, this summer we're putting lights in a stadium. And um, this, this year, I would anticipate we'll probably have more night games at home than we historically have had. Um, in my first year in 2005, both of those thoughts, uh, you know, were, uh, were, were not, we weren't capable of thinking of, you know, having our own permanent lights and what would that, what would that do to the architecture of the stadium? Oh my God, what are you doing? And then, you know, also thinking about having multiple night games coming off of the changes in, in our alcohol policy from 2002 and three uh, that President Holbrook implemented. But now we're, our fans are at a place where we can hold night games. Uh, we don't, we're not highly concerned with behavioral issues. Uh, and I think that's one of the great things. You know, we, we had an environment that was very tough in 2000, prior to 2004, really. You know, and, um, and I was blessed to inherit uh, the, the changes in an upward trajectory in fan behavior. Uh, and so that, that was a huge thing for us. If you look at what occurred with the riots and the alcohol that, that we had around the, state, around the stadium. So the culture and the behavior of our fans in the stadium has changed significantly to a point where we do some more things uh, that will position us for the 21st century. Uh, and I just think the, 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 the academic profile uh, of our institution has changed a lot as well. Uh, the quality academic quality of our students and, and uh, their performance in the classroom uh, you know, helped our retention rates and, and our profile and, and athletics has stayed on par with that which was significant so I can keep going but there's a lot of different things that I think uh, have positioned us better for 21st century athletic department and institution. While Ohio State plays a huge part in the Columbus athletic scene, there is another professional team right down High Street. That's right, Alice. The Columbus Blue Jackets have found their way into the playoffs for just the second time since their first NHL season in 2000. I was able to sit down with a Blue Jacket who spent a good amount of time right here on campus. Take a look. Amidst their playoff run, the Columbus Blue Jackets were kind enough to invite Buckeye TV down to Nationwide Arena to film a practice before sitting down with the longtime Blue Jacket, who also happens to be an Ohio State Buckeye, Mr. R.J. Umberger. Umberger spent three seasons at Ohio State before being drafted into the NHL and says he has some great memories of his time on campus just a couple of minutes down the street from his current workplace. Uh, you know, just my time there overall was, was awesome. I enjoyed every moment. Um, you know, I have a lot of fun memories of, uh, you know, the closeness I was with, with the guys on the team. Um, you know, on and off the ice, living, uh, living in, our, in our houses together. And, and uh, you know, we, we played a lot of hockey and a lot of good games. And uh, I remember, you know, making it to the NCAA tournament. Uh, we lost, obviously, but, um, you know, it was a lot of fun and it was a big deal to be in that tournament. So I have a lot of memories going back to that. Throughout the years, Umberger said that he has maintained a very strong relationship with Ohio State and has helped out the OSU hockey program, all the while making good friends with the Buckeyes head coach, Steve Rollick. Um, you know, I really like the direction they're going under Coach Rollick. Um, you know, there's really an emphasis to the program and making it something special. Um, I love seeing that. Um, kept in touch with them, uh, some of their players and, and especially the coach. And um, I was, you know, really paying attention to all the games. Um, 
you know, following the last uh, couple there in the Big Ten tournament on Twitter while I was away. So um, it was a shame. You know, they played their hearts out. They did a great job, uh, you know, battling two of the top seeds there. And um, you know, it was a shame it ended the way it did. But, uh, you know, I know myself and all the other alumni is really proud of the effort and really proud of the job that uh, Coach Rollick did. As Umberger watches and keeps track of the progress of the Ohio State hockey team, he spoke on how special it is for him to be playing professionally so close to home. It's uh, it's awesome for me. Um, you know, I, I love the city. You know, this is where I like to live. My, this is my home uh, year round, and um, you know, I feel such a connection to the people in this in this town. Uh, being a Buckeye and playing for the Blue Jackets, it's um, you know, it's really a lot of fun being able to stay connected to OSU and, and, and the hockey team and, and know those players and coach and and be able to uh, help out. Overall, Umberger would love nothing more than to bring playoff hockey in a Stanley Cup home to Columbus, as he says the city is yearning for a chance to show their true colors. You know, it's obviously a huge goal of mine. I mean, I've been through a lot of ups and downs in this program the last six years, and um, but one thing that never changes is uh, the diehard fans. They're here every day, um, you know, rooting us on, um, shedding their blood and sweat and tears just was with us. And, um, you know, I saw a taste of the playoffs my first year here, and it's been a long time to get back. And, you know, we're really anxious. We got close last year, but, um, you know, this town's ready for it. They're ready to explode, see playoff hockey, and, you know, ultimately I would like to see Stanley Cup here. For Buckeye TV, I'm Hayden Grove. Women's basketball's graduating seniors experienced a big change during their time at Ohio State when they welcomed a new head coach. Jordan Elwood has details on that transition. Another season is in the books for Ohio State women's basketball, but this past season was special for the Buckeye seniors. Their last year on the team was the first year for head coach Kevin McGuff. Prior to Coach McGuff, Coach Jim Foster was the head coach of the Ohio State women's basketball team for 11 seasons since 2002. Contributing six consecutive Big Ten titles and 10 straight NCAA tournament appearances to the program. He was a four-time Big Ten Coach of the Year, but Ohio State's 2012-2013 season fell short and Foster's coaching career at Ohio State ended. With a new head coach comes a new staff, but assistant coach Patrick Klein was asked to stay. It's always tough when your mentor, the person that got you into the business, um, has to go through sort of that change, especially such so late in his career with a lot of success. I think it was definitely a surprise for everyone on the team just because Coach Foster is a Hall of Fame coach. Mm -hmm. And uh, although we had struggled the past couple of years, the program that he had built here we thought was enough to keep him around. But uh, I think there definitely was a sense of excitement because people wanted something more out of the program. Transition is an aspect every player learns in basketball, but transitioning coaches and leadership can be difficult. Ohio State seniors were ready to embrace the change. Us as seniors tried to really embrace everything that Coach McGuff was throwing at us, that we were the positive ones, that we were the ones telling the other class, we're like, no, this is okay, we got to do it this way, let's give it a shot. Coach Foster was definitely more like thinking about it, like kind of quiet, like would talk to you one-on-one, -on -one, and Coach McGuff more kind of like in your face, like yelling, a lot of energy, kind of fun. It's really important that they kept an open mind towards the staff, the culture change, and I think that we're going to look back in three or four years about the program and competing you know, for championships and national championships, and we're going to look back at this senior class and give them a lot of credit because they were the ones that opened, you know, embraced this change with open arms, allowed them to um, sort of change a culture in a way that's going to set the platform for these next, next few years for Kevin. Senior Amy Scullion was out her freshman year due to a knee injury, giving her an extra year of eligibility. But she has decided to forgo her senior season to pursue medical school. You know, for me, this has been a great experience, and basketball is great. But for me personally, my main goal is to become a doctor and to start that career. And I just felt like it was the right time to make, to make that next step. As for the rest of the players, the new coaching staff has plans for the future of the program. You know, we're really going to carve out a really good style of play. You know, that's what Kevin's really good at. You know, we, we do the dribble drive offense, and I think that's going to be fun. It's going to be fun for our fans. It's going to be fun to win, uh, and it's all about sort of making Ohio State the national team and the national prominence that it deserves. Jordan Elwood, Buckeye TV. Well, that's all we have for you tonight from Buckeye TV Studios. Thanks so much for tuning in to our Buckeye TV live special, Time and Change at Ohio State. We hope you've enjoyed the broadcast as much as we've enjoyed bringing it to you. We'll leave you with the alma mater, Carmen Ohio, performed by Ohio State's very own a cappella group, Buck That. Time, Time and change, change will surely show how friend thy friendship, Ohio. Oh, come, let's
Seasons pass.